Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to The Deal Room Podcast, brought to you by Aspect Legal. Today's episode is part two of our very exciting two-part series with Dean Tavernar from Lifestyle Financial Services. Dean is our very first guest for our newest segment called Conversations at the Coalface, where I talk to people who are working at the coalface of organisations that are buying or selling to get perspectives from the ground up. We have a number of helpful tips and insights for our sellers out there as we take a deeper look into the whole integration process post-completion. So let's dive right in. Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, Dean. You talked about profitability. You talked about cultural fit, both in staff and the and the overall culture of the organisation. And you talked about needing to be able to see some upside, so some untapped potential that hasn't been exhausted in the organisation itself. Anything else in particular that you're looking for in um, in your targets? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so um, <laughs> it's really, really good in a potential sort of acquisition option if the quality of the information and the data that they have around the clients and the services they provide is neat and organized, basically, to put mm. it in really simple terms. So if the overall process of integrating the businesses doesn't have to work around piles of paperwork stacked in you know, archive boxes, mm and it's all sort of more easily accessible and organized, that is is a surprising headache saver. Mm. Well, not surprising that it saves you a bit of headache, but I think just surprising how much headache sometimes mm. because there's obviously a lot of detail in, especially if both companies have been running for you know, decades or, or whatever time frame you're talking about, there's obviously a lot of information behind all of that. And the more information that you can sort of actually absorb and utilize the better, I think. It's mm. not not great to take on 10 years worth of another business's information, put it in a box and never look at it because mm. no one's getting any value out of that. Not us as the purchaser, not the consumers who or the clients who may have you know, provided information or formed a relationship with this business that we've then basically just put in a box because for whatever reason that an easy way to absorb that information into our systems. I think that's a Mm. completely unideal situation. So just ease of integration of the basics is really, really helpful. I think this is a really good point that you're making because this is actually a point that perhaps is not made as often as um, some of the other points in relation to what organisations should do to get themselves ready for a sale. But certainly getting critical information that will be important to the buyer. So in in your case, it's, and and I guess perhaps most buyers' cases, it will be the way that they've structured the client databases and all of the critical information in the business in a way that is easily accessible and searchable and integratable as well. You know, I think that's, it's a really good point. And just to clarify, this is something that you go in through your DD process and look at at I mean, do you look at this before you agree on a price or is it is it a bit of an afterthought when, when you're going in and looking for your targets? No, this is definitely moved more to the front of the checklist. So yep. there is a bit of a checklist around this for us now that we've developed basically through experience. So it didn't start off that way, but <laughs> we learned from mistakes. And yeah, we do have a bit of a checklist now about the the quality of the client database and all of that sort of stuff as you just summarized really nicely mm. and that has has moved up in the timeline of the acquisition process so before um before price is agreed and everything is signed off we mm. want to have some understanding of what all of that architecture and infrastructure looks like because it can create some very very large costs potentially to us in integrating the businesses so we need to take that into account before 
paying for the asset. Mm. Okay, well, I'm going to call this Dean's hot tip here. (laughs) If you're a (laughs) business that's looking to acquire another business, maybe this is something that is at the end of your checklist that you should be bringing further forward, you know, before you're agreeing on price. And if you're a business that's looking to build itself ready for sale, once again, this is something that you should have in your important checklist to get yourself sorted well before going on the market because it's obviously a time-consuming exercise if a business has not got this stuff organized, getting it organized. And I hear I hear your pain, Dean. I hear you saying you want it to be them rather than you having to do all of that organization before the sale process kicks off, right? Uh, yeah, to put it bluntly, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, and, and then just, um, I guess, as a quick overview as well, what's, what's the size of financial plan businesses that you're buying or the range of sizes, I guess? Uh, yeah, it's been a pretty big range. So I'm guessing that we're going to be talking about size in terms of uh, revenue of the business. And yeah, yeah. Um, we've gone from, from definitely pretty small. So in the you know, around 100, 200,000 per year. And there we're just talking about buying a, a portion of the client book, not the entire business. Right. So that would be the smaller end of the transactions that we've done. And then up to uh, around the sort of one and a half million revenue per annum businesses. Got it. Okay, cool. All right, great. So earlier on, you mentioned, you touched on the fact that sometimes you're buying the businesses or the assets and sometimes you're buying the whole company, i.e. the shares of the company. So maybe if you can just give us a quick outline, when you're buying the shares of the company, why are you buying the shares? What's the benefit to you in, in that purchase as opposed to the business out of the company? Yeah. Okay. So when we've bought sort of the whole package, um, either the whole business or with the share arrangement. Actually, and I should be clear that we've only in the end done that once right. uh, to date, uh-huh. at least that I know of. Yep. <laughs> it's been, it, it creates some ease of operations for us in that we can keep that business running as is and quite slowly go through whatever changes or integrations amalgamations that we need to make in the way that they do things or uh, you know, where the clients sit and so on. It essentially buys us time because we can buy in and then leave things running as is until we've got the capacity, until we've checked everything that we need to check and we know we're ready to move on whatever particular part of the integration project we're looking at. Uh, whereas we've found that if we purchase the bare minimum, which for us in this industry is just purchasing the book of clients, then we're under certain time frames. You know, we have to uh, issue letters to certain people and and basically integrate the clients into our way of doing things um, with you know, set levels of of notice and sign off from multiple parties within certain time frames. So it just makes it potentially a lot more rushed. Mm. In the end, I think the destination for both purchase types is the same. In that. I can't see too much benefit, um, at least in the businesses we've looked at so far, of operating them completely separately. Mm. There's obvious synergies to be gained from amalgamating. So it's just a matter of how rushed that ends up being and Mm. the reason to therefore not purchase more comprehensively or buy the shares uh, has come down to that we're only purchasing for instance, a portion of the client book is an obvious reason or potential basically skeletons in the closet. So if the due diligence comes up with any kind of question marks over anything, it's uh, it's safer for us to scale down the complexity of what we buy. Yep. Okay. Um, and we can still make the same transaction and then we just need to implement a bit faster. Yeah. Okay. So this is a really good point because there's this common debate that goes around in the sort of business sizes that you're talking about that are your targets and and the deal sizes, about this concept of buying the business rather than the shares themselves. And it has an implication for owners right in the beginning in relation to how they structure their businesses as well. But it's really interesting that I hear you say, because there's this philosophy that it can be harder sometimes to, in deal sizes of this size, to have a buyer agree to buy their shares as opposed 
opposed to just the assets and the business uh, w- without the shares as a whole and the skeletons in the cupboard, as you say. But it, it's interesting to hear you talk about some of these actual practical benefits of buying the shares themselves, as long as you can satisfy yourself that through your due diligence that there's not likely to be or that that there's a a lesser risk of there being skeletons in the um, closet of these businesses. So it's interesting to hear you talk about the practical aspects of the ability of buying a company as a whole, giving you the time and the space to integrate it at your leisure, as opposed to buying the business, which requires all of the transition to happen pretty much exactly starting from the date of completion, right? That's it. You've got your time, your clock starting now and you have to get it all transitioned as quickly as possible when you're going for the alternative, which is buying the business or the assets themselves. Good. Okay. All right. So maybe if you could give us a little insight perhaps into what issues have you seen that has arisen as part of your the component that you've been involved in in acquisitions. Sure. Okay. So definitely, I think the main one with the larger acquisitions has been the culture fit, which I know I've already talked about. So we'll keep it pretty brief, but making sure that there's a good culture fit and that cultural change is is pushed if it needs to happen. So if you can see the business you've bought and your existing business and know which culture you want to be the culture of the company, then pushing the staff of whichever culture you're trying to change slowly but consistently, I think, is has been the biggest challenge. Mm. And having spoken to a couple of sort of culture change experts on this, you know, there is no golden arrow, so to speak, that will sort this out. An average of a 24-month process to get proper cultural change and cultural alignment in an acquisition uh, phase, at least according to to one of the people I spoke to, um, Mm. whose name I wish I could remember, but I cannot (laughs) right now. (laughs) And and that pretty much aligns with what we've seen. So one of the businesses that we where we've brought on some staff, it um it's been a slow but good process. I mean we're we're getting the outcomes that we're looking for, and I think the staff are happy Mm. on both sides of the fence. So both in the in the purchase business and the existing business we held, which has been really good. But I just think that it's important to go into that kind of situation with the idea that, hey, this this will take a while. This will take probably anywhere between, I'd say, 12 and 36 months. I, I don't think you could get proper cultural change in under 12 months unless you're a wizard. Mm. So the issue here is that essentially whatever business it is, it will take time for this culture change to occur. Um, and and have you had, you know, have you, do you feel you've lost staff because of approaches to this at, at some points or is it just that it is a long process? I think more that it's a long process. Yeah. I don't think I could say that we've lost any, I mean, we haven't really lost any any staff due to cultural changes, I believe. There's definitely not been any really quick or sudden turnover, yep. uh, which has been good, thankfully. Yeah, I think it's just to be aware that it's a slow process and that you're not necessarily going to get the best cooperative work out of a team for a while down the track and that there will be a bit of time for HR if you're lucky enough to have a separate HR department. Mm. Yeah, a bit of extra time in just kind of coaching people through the changes and and managing that process. Yep. Okay, great. All right. So culture fit, that was one of the issues. Have there been any other issues in integration? Yeah, the other main one that comes to mind is one I think I hinted at earlier of actually when we were talking about the owners of the, oh, sorry, the sellers kind of coming on board to help affect the change. Mm. A challenge for us has been getting the message in that cooperation, I guess, correct and clear. So the message to suppliers, the message to you know, other contractors, to the staff, but most importantly to the clients mm. about what's happening and what everyone's role is going forward. Mm. And that's been a, a, a recurring theme, the role thing especially. So who does what and, and what is happening? Is it an acquisition? Is it a, a cooperative arrangement? Have they you know, sold to us? Have they merged with us? Have they partnered with us? I think the wording of these things could potentially be easy to overlook 
Mm. But if you do sort of brush past it and one party is thinking that it's a partnership and the other party's thinking it's a takeover, I think that tends to come out in the communication mm. that goes out a little later down the track. And especially if that goes to clients and the wrong perception of the whole arrangement is created, that can be hard to unwind. So, mm. And so how do you deal with that now then? Is this something that you have a clear approach now on on discussing, you know, right up front but before completion and how you're going to deal with communication or is that something that you're dealing still post-completion? No, that's definitely brought into the fold before uh, completion of the deal. Yep. Yep. Because it, it can have such a big impact for such a, what could be seen as such a minor thing. So having at least some discussion about what the communication will look like and, and what the phrasing of the overall deal is going to be to even just in an informal circumstance to external players, mm. uh, that's definitely something that we discuss as part of the deal making process at this stage and then essentially just revisit it. So the general general attitude that more communication is better seems to apply. So just constantly sort of revisiting with the buyer with the seller and talking about how the communications with clients are going, how the handovers are going and what those conversations actually look like. So what, what words are being used and what reactions are coming out of it and just keeping that as an ongoing process over that, as I said, roughly 12 months that we seem to be settling on for a, a transition and handover period. Let's take a short break. When we get back, I ask Dean about the returns enjoyed by Lifestyle Financial Services from having this acquisition focus. And we get a little personal by asking Dean about the lessons he's learned from all of the integrations he's worked on. And finally, we'll close this two-part series with some helpful tips for all of our sellers out there. And that's next. This is Joanna Oki, and you've been listening to The Deal Room, a podcast brought to you by Aspect Legal. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition or to discuss how we can work with your clients if you're an advisor in this space. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au or if it's easier, just shoot me an email at joanna at aspectlegal.com.au. interested in hearing smart legal tips for business, the Deal Room sister podcast, Talking Law, is perfect for you. These two podcasts are now among the top legal podcasts in Australia. In our Talking Law podcast, I dissect a different topic each week that I have seen impact businesses and I then provide actionable tips for you to avoid that risk or to use that legal area to your advantage. We release new episodes every 10 days and you can listen to our episodes through www.talkinglaw.com.au or subscribe to our Talking Law podcast on iTunes to be the first to know when a new episode is out. Now back to the show. Welcome back. Earlier, Dean talked to us about the other things that they consider when seeking an acquisition target. He also had a lot of interesting things to say about the strategy that's behind the decision to buy shares versus buying the business, as well as the issues that he has seen come up during the integration phase. So let's keep the conversation going and dive into the benefits of using acquisition as a growth strategy. returns then 
has the organisation seen so far from these acquisitions? There's the obvious financial returns. So your revenue and EBIT have gone up. You know, mm-hmm. operating profit has has gone up, mm-hmm. which is great. Um, obviously, <laughs> that's yeah. arguably the whole point half the time. <laughs> but some of the softer benefits, I think, is, include the the scale that we're getting and the things that come along with scale. So we're able to um, to enact better deals outside of the acquisition space as well. Simply by the size that we're gathering in this in the industry, we can have a different kind of conversation with suppliers and with just with other entities that we we work with because we've got more more clout, I suppose, more customers to to use in those conversations as a bargaining chip, to put it in a, in a really cutthroat way. But for the benefit of our staff and our clients, mm. we, get, we can get better deals on things and we can look at technologies and services that are out of price range for smaller organizations and that basically don't make sense with a smaller number of clients. So we're looking at scaled systems that hopefully will deliver you know, services that our clients really, really like that just wouldn't have been possible at a smaller scale. Mm. That's kind of the crux of the whole strategy really is to open up extra opportunities by getting that scale. Mm. Okay, great. That's fabulous. And, and I guess on a personal note, what do you feel like you've learned through your work in all of these integrations, I guess, that you've been working on? Oh wow, <laughs> um, a lot. Yeah, a lot. I maybe even don't know where to begin. I think I've learned a lot about uh, people and how to how to have these conversations, how to be really genuine as well, because that's what shines through is through all these talks and the implementation. And you know, there's a lot of working with other people to make things happen, and it becomes obvious who's genuine and who's looking out for their business their staff and their clients yeah, and who's just kind of looking at the bottom line and not much else. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Yeah. And the, it, it starts to really shine through. And I think the genuine people or the people who you can have a sort of more genuine, broader scope conversation with, those relationships are easier to work with and the results speak for themselves in the long run. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I could probably go on for a while about what I've learned, although there's... <laughs> There's the dilemma of choice. There's so much there that I'm struggling to <laughs> give the next step. Yeah, it's been an amazing experience getting involved right at the start of this pretty rapid acquisition growth phase. Yeah, right. So, and and I can hear that. I can hear, and and I think probably a lot of people that are listening into this podcast are listening in because they're interested and they're involved in in some way in um in this area of sales and acquisitions. And you know, and this is why I love the area too because I feel like it's a high energy environment and mostly dealing with some parties on both sides who are all all of the parties are aligned for the same reason or you know and to the same outcome which is to to get a successful deal across the line um you know in a way where everyone ends up happy you know and and this is particularly as a lawyer you can't always say that for all areas of law so it's a reason why I love it and certainly I can I can hear in the things that you've been talking about today that you've found this area a, an interesting and exciting sort of area to be involved in yeah very much and I completely agree an area where you're working on win-win-win situations. The client should come out better, the seller and the buyer should both be happy. So what's not to love? Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) Okay, so to wrap it up then, I I guess let's get really practical. If we have any financial planning businesses here that are looking to sell, I guess you can probably talk very authoritatively as a buyer. What is it that you recommend? What are the tips for financial planning businesses that are looking to sell? And and maybe some of these tips I I think probably are applicable to businesses as a whole that are looking to sell. But let's stick to your space. What what tips do you have for these sorts of businesses? Okay, so tips for sellers. Um, I'm thinking, firstly, make sure that what you've got is is organized. No one wants to buy into a mess. And I mean that at both a pretty base level and a 
sort of higher, broader scope level, even as simple as if you're going to have a, a meeting in your offices, if someone walks in and it's a, a total mess of paperwork everywhere, that's not a great first impression um, <laughs> for something that you might be buying into. Uh-huh. But yeah, getting down, drilling with that theme down specifically to financial planning, you know, making sure that you've got clear records of all your compliance obligations and, you know, if they've been met, when they've been met, you know, records of all your communications with your clients, all that sort of stuff just goes to show that you've got got a hand on what's happening. You've got good control over your business and your processes and that there's it's not going to be buying into such a fixer upper, basically. Mm. Mm. Yep. Um and then making sure that whoever you talk to if you're looking to sell, you you can work with because I don't think either party will benefit if you end up doing a deal and then walk away and sort of dust your hands and consider it done. Mm-hmm. I think there needs to be that cultural and personal alignment, mm-hmm. similar set of attitudes and values, and that you can work together for a while to make sure that you both get the utmost possible good value for the buyer, the seller, and the clients out of the transaction um, mm. It's a it's a medium to long term play. Not a, I just don't think it works as well as a short term game. And I think that's I love that point, Dean. I really like that point because I think sometimes what happens is that organisations don't think about properly about selling until the point where really they're already emotionally out of the door already. And I guess the message here that we're hearing from you is if you leave it that late, then maybe your options of buyer or the amount that you're likely to get for your business are going to be impacted because in your view, at least in relation to the acquisitions that you guys are doing over there at Lifestyle Financial Services, you're looking for people to give it a little bit of time and to do a proper handover and transition. And I think you've thrown about the time period of that minimum of a year. You you want people to be there and not just there, but on board emotionally as well, right? To help transition properly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. Super good points there, Dean. I just want to say a massive thank you for your time. It's been really interesting hearing about you speak about the integration issues really at the coalface because that's where you're sitting. And, you you know, as an advisor, quite often we're deeply involved in leading up to the point of exchange and then completion. But but it's you guys who are working on the integration, I guess, that prove uh, it, it doesn't all finish when completion happens. Indeed, in your your uh, experience are probably really is only just starting once completion happens. So um, there's a hell of a lot more to do after completion uh, to make sure it's a properly integrated whole. Okay, Dean, thank you so much for your time. And look, I, I guess maybe it's worth saying then you're on the lookout for more acquisitions. So I guess if any of our listeners here have good financial planning businesses that fit some of that criteria of what you're looking for in the target, you're probably out there looking. Is that right? Yeah, definitely open to any opportunities that are going to fit that win-win goal that we're looking at. Great. Okay. And how should they contact you then, Dean? We can definitely put some links through from our show notes on our website, thedealroompodcast.com, and we'll have a link right through to Dean there. But um, Dean, also let us know how they can contact you directly if they don't want to go through our website. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Best way is probably just to get me via email. So that's Dean, D-E-A-N, at your lifestyle dot com dot au um, and you can just google us as well it's lifestyle financial services and we're based in chatswood in sydney fabulous wonderful okay well once again thank you so much dean and we hope to talk again soon yeah great thanks i'd love to do it again thanks very much And just as a quick recap, Dean talked about the sorts of things that they look for in their targets, which I don't think really are confined just to the financial services industry. And his example, he's talking about profitable organisations, having a cultural fit for staff and overall culture, having some upside still there. I thought that was a really interesting point from Dean. So here they were looking for a way that they could continue to add value, not that 
those organisations where the value was already tapped out as much as possible. And organisation and systems. I think that was a key issue. Obviously, Dean had felt the pain of trying to integrate disorganised systems and information spread. So certainly for any of our listeners who are out there and preparing their businesses for sale, take heed because this is a way that maybe you can gear yourself up for a better sale price and, you know, a broader range of prospective buyers. Then we had a brief discussion about earnouts, and I thought that was a really interesting discussion because, as I said during the discussion, earnouts can be a little bit controversial. So it's great to hear some feedback from the coalface about how earnouts can really work beneficially for both parties. Obviously, Dean was talking there from the buyer perspective, but he certainly made reference to the fact that they had actually made payments in these earnouts and he'd some of, seen some of the cash going out the door. So for businesses who are concerned about the earnout component, maybe that's a useful bit of information to see that earnouts can and do get paid. But obviously, from a legal perspective, it's about making sure the detail is right and making sure you're not signing up to an earnout if you've got no control over you receiving that earnout at the end of the day. And of course, from a legal perspective, there are a lot of considerations with earnouts, and you need to make sure not only that you've got control or some control about meeting the criteria for the earnout at, at the time that it becomes applicable, but also that you have security for ensuring that it's paid if something were to happen to the business or the business were to be transferred between the period of time that you complete and the earnout is payable. So there's a lot to think about with earnouts, but I thought Dean's discussion here threw some good light on to how it can work in the positive when everyone's working to, together. And the final issue uh, that I wanted to talk about here today that I thought was particularly interesting from the things Dean was talking about was the question of structure. I thought it was really interesting that Dean had found in his position as dealing with the integrations, at least, that acquiring the shares of a company actually made it easier in the acquisition process than acquiring the business or acquiring the assets. So I think this is an important thing for businesses to bear in mind if they're gearing themselves up for a sale into the future or indeed making that difficult decision right at the beginning of setting up a business as to whether or not they're going to adopt a company structure or a trust structure if they're a smaller business and might be thinking of operating through a trust structure because sometimes you know there might be reasons why a buyer will find you more attractive in a share sale but if you think you are going to sell the share shares of your organisation rather than just the assets at any point in time. As Dean says, you better be sure that you have got a um, fairly tight ship when it comes to due diligence. And you certainly don't want to be leaving it up to the point of due diligence for surprises to appear. Because in the instance of Dean finding these surprises through the acquisitions that he worked on, it it then led their organisation to change the strategy from a share purchase to a business or asset purchase. So if you work with businesses where it's going to be better for them to sell the shares, then we really need to ensure that these businesses are properly primed for sale and properly primed for the full due diligence process that they are likely to be going through. So it really means, once again, that it's extremely important to get these businesses sale ready early rather than late, obviously. Okay, great. If you would like more information about this topic, head over to our website where you can find a transcript of this podcast episode and you'll also be able to find a way to contact Dean Tavenar directly if you are or you know of a financial planning business that's looking to sell. Look, Dean was such a great sport on this on this podcast that if you're a business that's involved in acquisitions, he might even be willing to catch up for a quick coffee one day and talk about his experiences in integrating these businesses post-completion. So head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. 
Com. And there you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal. If you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of sales or acquisitions, we've got a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition or help them through the transaction process. And as we discussed today, preparation is critical. Look, we work with clients both big and small, so don't hesitate to book an appointment if you'd like to find out how we may be able to assist. Look, finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. I'd be ever so grateful. And if you have any topics that you would like us to cover on this podcast, please just drop me a note through our website at thedealroompodcast.com or through our legal website at Aspect legal.com.au. Thanks again for listening in. You have been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room podcast sponsored by Aspect Legal. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. Thank you.